are we at? We are at, I just have to make sure this timestamp, because we're going to delete this from the, the actual video when we upload it. So we're at 8.56. That's okay. We'll just do it at 9. All right. Hello, students, and welcome to class. Uh, we're talking about Egypt today. So for those of you that are in history class or are wondering how this corresponds to your history class, this should be after the early human civilization, such as uh, Neanderthal, uh, Homo erectus, Homo sapiens, that sort of thing, um, chapter two for a lot of your books. This is when you guys will start talking about very early thriving civilizations as opposed to the start of civilization. No surprise it took months last time. Yeah, I. that's what I kind of don't understand. What What is, uh, so for those of you that were not here um, a few minutes earlier and just joining us in the, the video after the live stream, um, we were talking about the um, stimulus check situation for people in the United States and you're just kind of wondering why some people get it and some people don't. Um, I feel like, I, I don't know why it's such a clunky system. Um, hopefully this will be changed, but you never know. Um, so did anyone want to talk about what is the new year? Um, so did anyone want to talk about any, any things before, you know, just like in, in a normal class, we don't have to dive right into the PowerPoint. Um, did anyone want to talk about any of their ideas for 2021? If they have any hopes, especially for those of you, I think most of you are here are in the United States. So if you have any hopes for, you know, the new president, um, if you just have stuff about Egypt that you wanted to talk about, or this is what I've heard about Egypt, or I'm not sure, but I think I heard this about Egypt. Did anybody have that? For me, I don't typically make a New Year's resolution, but everyone always asks. So I do have one that I always say, which is, well, I hope to live through another year because if that's my New Year's resolution, I will be successful all the time, except for one time, and then I won't care. So if you want to use that too, feel free. Uh, but that is my, my, that's my, my permanent New Year's resolution is just to, to live through the next and, you know, see the next year. So we'll, we'll see. Um, yes, yeah, so all things considered, you know, we, we shall see. Um, if it helps, did anybody want like a, like a little, I don't know, after school mental health chat? Um, you guys can, you know, we can get together and just, you guys can vent about stuff. You know, I'm not, I'm not a therapist or anything. Um, but I, you know, just don't mind giving you guys a place to talk and have someone listen to you. If you guys think that'll be helpful, um, please let me know. Okay. Um, have you seen any picture of Egypt from the 1980s? They look a lot more of Europe. Yes. Um, there's also some pictures like from the 60s and 70s as well. Um, there's a lot of the same with Iran and Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iran, Afghanistan, definitely. Um, they are really interesting images uh, before the Islamic Revolution. So it's it's a really stark contrast, I think is the, the most neutral way to say that. <laughs> it's a very stark contrast, yes. All right, I'm gonna let you guys answer my, my questions that I had posed to you. Um, there is a bit of a delay between when I speak and when it actually shows up. So I'm gonna have my tea and let you guys talk. I hope I don't cough too much. <coughs> I have uh, elderflower, dried elderflower in here, so. My immune system needs all the help it can get. I'm not taking elderflower for my immune system by itself and whatever, and I'm not recommending that you guys do it too. I've talked to my doctor and all this other stuff, right? Um, but I'm taking everything I can for my immune system um, just because I've been dealing with uh, an issue with my lymph nodes that they're not sure what it is. So I've called it Schrodinger's virus and we'll see, we'll see. Does anybody have any favorite parts of ancient Egypt or maybe any favorite gods from ancient Egypt? Um, when we say gods, it's sort of like, I think that term is starting to change. Um, like the term actor and actress, we just say actor now as the gender, gender neutral term. 
Um, we've done that with words in the past, like murderer. We just use murderer. We don't say murderess anymore. Um, and I think that's sort of changed with gods and goddesses. Uh, just such a mouthful to say goddesses. Uh, or we could just say deities. So you have any favorite deities at all? Would you lecture in a British posh accent? It sounds more Christian. I don't think I can do a British posh accent. I think the last time we did that on Patreon, somebody said that I sounded like I was from Bath. So that's, that's what British people tell me that of my accent, there were parts that are like, oh, you're obviously not, not British. But if I were to assume you were British, you sound like you're from Bath. I don't know if that's an insult or what. <laughs> um, you know, it's like, oh yeah, your American accent sounds like you're from backwater Kentucky. You know, it's like, is that is that a good thing? Is it a bad thing? I don't think it's a bad thing. Just a, it's its own thing. I like ibis. Yes, the the ibis. Let's look at that bird. Oh, okay. <laughs> Ibis, there we are. So the god that you're thinking of probably is Thoth, that is uh, the god of writing and the god of like education. So <laughs> one of my favorites. But yes, the ibis-headed goth is Thoth. That's our good friend Thoth. It's such a fun looking bird though. There's a lot of really interesting stuff and I love being able to teach history and teach geography. Um, please let me know if you would like me to finish the whole year of history before I start geography or if I should also teach geography at this like concurrently. Um, I don't mind doing either. I just don't know if that would be too annoying to have like multiple live streams in a day or, or what. So please just let me know what you guys would prefer. Um, we're still having that nose drippy issue from yesterday. Do excuse me. Um, <sighs> So I like being able to talk to the geography students about um, what's going on in the Nile. Oh, because there's a lag now, I can see the top of my head. And it's, it's just a part of your body you don't see very often. Uh, I studied a di an, under a dialect teacher from My Fair Lady. Oh, that's very cool. That's very cool. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I don't know if you guys want to hear my British accent, but good it is it's definitely not posh right it's not a posh accent not at all <laughs> so it's very very not posh um all right so we're gonna go ahead and just get started and we got our good friends like the sumerians that we talked about last time and we use this image too i tend to use the same images um because i think it helps to jog the memory um, especially if I make a comment on the image, like how this guy really looks like one of my cousins. Um, so it's kind of kind of fun. So of course, Egypt is built around a river. Does anyone remember what Mesopotamia means? I know that you guys are not like right in front of me, but I'm still giving you time to answer. Apparently, the average question answer gap that teachers usually give is less than one second. So they say like, do you know what this means? It means this. Uh, I, why? So I don't mind waiting. I, I'm very good with just st sitting here quietly uh, because of the military. <laughs> you just, they had to just sit in silence for so long. Good go. Not posh. Agreed. Exactly. Yes. It's, it's not a, not a, <laughs> it's not posh at all. <laughs> between two rivers. Exactly. Yes. Mesopotamia is between two rivers. Awesome. So the Nile actually isn't one river, it actually is two rivers that becomes one river. And so we have this white Nile here, and we have the blue Nile over here, um, that's over in Ethiopia. Um, these are going to start in mountains, and so that means just like any other river situation, you're going to start with the source of the river, which means the, the start of the river that's in the mountains. And then the mouth of the river, which is the end of the river, is going to be usually in a sea, uh, an ocean, or a lake. Um, unless it just like goes underground, which happens sometimes in like Eastern Europe, for example. Um, the way I tell the students to kind of remember that the difference between source and mouth um, source, you can think of origin or something that might help you, but mouth, you can definitely 
bleh, that's where it comes out, right? It just like vomits into the sea, which is a very disgusting image, I know. But because it's disgusting, you'll remember it, okay? So that's, that's the whole point. Um, right, so good. You got the between two rivers and between the rivers. Very good. So the Blue Nile and White Nile come together and we end up with um, the Nile, <laughs> okay? Um, so the White Nile, and again, we'll talk about this more with uh, the geography stuff, uh, but the White Nile has several cataracts, which are not cataracts, but they are uh, like uh, waterfalls. Um, and so that might be one of the reasons to call it white, just because there's so many rapids and that sort of thing going on. And then we end it in this delta. Again, you're supposed to be taking geography before taking history, but that's not your guys' fault. I started teaching history first. So the delta here, it's just from our good friends in Greek, alpha, beta, gamma, delta. It's just shaped like a triangle upside down, and that's our delta, okay? Um, so this happens just because as a river is flowing fast and it hits this body of water that's not flowing very fast and also some of the water is coming up towards the coast and the river's coming out, it just kind of slows the river down. And as we slow that river down, we're spreading it out a bit and we end up with this really cool looking tree looking thing. I wish they would have called it a tree instead of a delta, but then again, I guess that would have been confusing a river tree river branches. I don't know. Geography is very straightforward in a lot of its its nomenclature, thankfully. All right. Hope you guys are having fun learning about rivers. <laughs> so because we end up with these Nile differences, um, we're also, and because also we have uh, the higher altitude portion of the Nile is in the south, so the mountains are in the south, in other words. Um, upper Egypt is in the south and lower Egypt is in the north, okay? Um, rivers do not flow uphill, but rivers absolutely can flow from north to, to or from south to north, okay? So we're, as long as south is uphill, it's gonna flow that way. There is some confusion that north means up. Um, so I just wanted to, to clarify that. It's totally fine for rivers to flow. <clears throat> they can flow north as long as north is downhill. Okay, so we just, just so we're, we're clear on that. Um, so why, why do we have this separation just because of that? Let me see if I had put it into the PPT here. No, that's okay. It's for the other PowerPoint, that's fine. Um, so the reason that we're splitting this up is because as I said, the White Nile and these parts in like Upper Egypt, these Nile parts in Upper Egypt, we end up having all of these um, these waterfalls. Now, I know this, this might be difficult to think back, you know, 4,000 years, 3,000 years. Is it easy to take a wooden boat up and down a river with waterfalls? No. So those are the reasons that it's really going to stop us. Um, a lot of people tend to think of rivers or seas or oceans as sort of a barrier between civilizations, especially if the river's quite wide. But in reality, rivers, seas, and oceans are more like highways. These are the ways that ancient people could travel very, very quickly. So the river, of course, is what we want to use for traveling between upper and lower Egypt, but that's gonna be pretty difficult, right? Uh, with all those, those waterfalls. So that means if I wanna do any trade or invasion or anything like that, it's mostly going to be by foot. Okay, so that's not the, the easiest thing to do, and that's why Upper and Lower Egypt were separated for a time, okay? Just so we know. And I'm gonna check back on our host here, or thing here. I, I don't know why this is always so hard for me to split this screen. My goodness, I feel like, I feel old. <laughs> um, so happy that you're back. What happened to your channel? Oh, thank you, Summer. Yes, fantastic. That's a great, that's a great way to, to do it. Yes, um, yes, I don't know, person jugs, Captain Jugs. I don't know if you're you're Mr. or Ms. or Mux or what, um, but yes, that's that's what we're doing. So we're, we're kind of relaunching it more of a, um, like a different live stream sort of thing. Not just because the student found it, that's, that's definitely the biggest push. Um, but I thought it might be fun to have these live streams. A lot of people really responded well to the live streams that we were doing before. 
Um, and I thought it might be fun to run it like a class, especially since everyone is kind of stuck indoors and stuff. So we got our good friend Silt. <clears throat> Has anybody heard of Silt? Anybody at all? You can see the Silt. It looks pretty. It's red. But has anybody heard of Silt? Mr. Jiggy, like the kind of banjo kazooie. Okay, Mr. Jiggy it is. See, it's not that hard to call people things that they want to be called, right? The more you know. <laughs> so what is silt? Has anybody heard of silt, but don't, they don't actually understand what it means? You're like, yeah, it comes from the Nile, the Nile silt. I had to memorize that for school, but what, what, what is it? Why is it good? Uh, Mississippi connected Midwest and Mexico next year. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, the only downside for a lot of people that were traveling in the early um, start of, I guess, the United States from the eastern side to the, the western side is there's not really anything that goes east to west like that. And you end up with this big mountain range in the middle. So you're kind of going upstream and then you got to climb over some mountains and then go downstream. Um, so it's not, not the easiest thing to navigate uh, by river, yeah, for sure. Those people were really trying, um, and it's definitely easy to see why there were um, just like packs of people, you know what I mean? Just uh, these, these civilizations of the Native Americans, they didn't like span super huge distances, because um, why would you, you know? Um, so does everyone, so does anyone maybe doesn't know what silt is? So the reason I'm asking is, you know, number one, interaction is cool. Uh, but number two, how much of this do I have to explain? That's, that's the other thing I want to kind of gauge. Um, I'm totally fine with explaining this to you guys. Don't worry. I've noticed that, um, it's interesting that I think everybody watching this right now, or at least is participating is an adult. And we kind of get on teenagers because when we ask them questions, they don't answer them. And we ask them these questions um, and, you know, well, how come you don't answer? Well, I don't want to look silly. I don't want to look stupid. But for a lot of times, adults react the same way. And so that's one reason I try to explain to the students that you only look stupid if you pretend like you know. <laughs> that's the only time you look stupid. Um, yeah, so you're not sure what silt is. That's totally fine. You guys have probably heard of it, though, right? I, I felt the same way when I was learning um, uh, about things like textiles. That was never explained to me in school, but I had to just memorize textiles. And of course, we didn't have the internet like we do today. So I you know, would hear the word and kind of forget to look it up in the dictionary later. And every time the teacher talked about it, I was just like, are these tiles with text on it? <laughs> Like, like, is it cuneiform tablets or something? But that doesn't make sense. Why would that be part of, like, a, you know, an, an economy? Like, I didn't get it. And the teacher never explained it. It was just reading out of the book. This is what textiles are. This is silt. Remember, silt comes out of the Nile River. Blah, blah. And so they never explained it. Um, so I always want to make sure that we're on the same page. <clears throat> so for silt, it is awesome for farming. And I just want to show this to you really quick, and then we'll explain what silt is. So from between June and September, we get this action here, which I was afraid was going to happen. That's okay. So June and September, you get this river that goes over the riverbank. So it just, it floods. Okay. <clears throat> when that comes back, it goes back into the river and the river goes into its normal situation then that's when you start planting, your first planting of the year or after the, the main flood. Now notice where people live. They're not gonna live in this, this region here, okay? This is called a flood plain, because it's a plain that floods. Um, the flood plain is, you know, you wanna live as close to the flood plain as you can, so you can be very close to your fields. However, please do understand, because um, you still, you might wonder, why do those people live there? They know that this river floods, right? And so we end up with, we hear about um, people that are dying in a flood, their homes are swept away. And so the first thought might be, well, how come they were living so close to a river if they know that river floods? So this floodplain here that we see, this is the normal floodplain. This is the year to year floodplain. However, 
about every 100 years, we end up with something that goes out even further. So we end up with a flood that might come out to over here, because I think you guys can see my mouse. Um, so it will actually swallow up some of these homes. That bigger section is called the 100 year floodplain. So we want to be careful of that. And so you still, again, might be thinking, well, you know, why don't you just live on the outside of the 100 year floodplain? Number one, maybe it's a bit far to walk, especially if you have a lot of children. Um, number two, living in that area that can be prone to a surprise flood, um, that's going to usually be a little bit cheaper. So if you're a family that doesn't have a lot of money, you're probably going to live on the 100 year floodplain, but not within the yearly floodplain. So that is just something to, to be aware of. Okay. Um, what are some things that could cause the river to flood extra? Like, why would it flood extra? Why does it flood every year? Like, why, why are we even flooding every year? Why does this happen at all? So I'm going to go and check this. Um, has anyone here visited Egypt? No, um, AABB, but there is a person who does join us pretty regularly named Shugal, and Shugal lives in Egypt. Um, hoping 2021 is better than 2020. We'll see. We're on day two, so we'll see. I'm sure 2021 will be better. I got big plans this year. Hopefully vaccines bring the COVID lockdowns to an end. I think I read that China just approved a new vaccine, and it's like a general vaccine. Uh, we shall see. Um, summer, maybe you and I, maybe we'll go to Egypt. Okay, let's just let's just do it. Let's just go to Egypt. Uh, we have to be careful though, because there are certain laws that we do have to observe, um, even as tourists. So we do want to be careful with that. All right. So why whoop, <clears throat> why do we get this flood happening? Sorry, I've lost my spot here. Every year. What's, what's some kind of event that's going to be causing this flood yearly, starting around early summer? Can we think of something? You know, I think that we take a lot of this stuff just for granted, right? Oh, yeah, rivers flood. That's what they do. You know, but we don't, we don't think about why this is happening. So we don't understand, well, why would a 100-year floodplain need to exist? So those are, those are some things we, we need to make sure we establish what would it be so while you guys are thinking about that why do rivers flood yearly not like oh there's a hurricane and everything got crazy like yearly why do they flood <clears throat> could be monsoon Absolutely. So that's a wind system that brings a lot of rain, um, especially in the summer um, in the southeast slash east slash south Asia. Um, and so we can actually look at the monsoon wind pattern just to see, is that going to apply? <clears throat> so we have some of the West African monsoon so that's not going to be us. We're up here. Um, and then we're going to have this South Asia monsoon, and that's going to be over here. And we can see Korea gets it. That's why Korea's summers are so wet. And they're, um, <clears throat> sorry, and the winters now are so dry, which is one reason I have to keep drinking stuff. So that's a great, great guess. That's not the case in this, pl this particular region, but that is the case in definitely some other regions. Snow melts, yes. So that snow melts that we're gonna have happening in the summer, not so much the spring, in the mountains. That's gonna be it. So now we can think, well, what would cause that 100 year floodplain? Perhaps extra heavy snowfall that year. So that's, that's one of the reasons that will happen. Um, so now what is silt? So as we're going through the river, <clears throat> we can go back up here to this river delta. One of the reasons this starts to deposit silts is because as we're rushing down this like river and we're going to the mouth of the river, which is the slow sea coming at us here, we're rushing and rushing and rushing psh, and we slow down. All of this suspended particulate, all these little particles that are suspended in that rushing water suddenly drop out. 
the river is not moving quickly enough to suspend that anymore. And you guys know exactly how that works, right? You have your, uh, you could have sand or something in a clear glass of water. And when you swirl it up, <clears throat> the faster you go, the higher those sand particles can be suspended in the water. But as soon as that water slows down or stops moving, all of that sand just kind of falls to the bottom. It's the same concept here. So wait a minute, isn't sand not that great to grow stuff in? Exactly. So it's not just sand, it's going to be all of those dead things. And we know that plants love dead stuff, right? So all of those dead things that the water had picked up, um, the pieces of that fish, <clears throat> excuse me, the pieces of the fish that had died where maybe the, you know, a crocodile or something is eating the rest of the fish, but you get those little pieces that are coming off and they build up over time. Um, anything that's sunk to the bottom and wasn't eaten for some reason, but the moving of the water is um, jostling that around and picking it up and carrying it, all of that nutrition now becomes suspended in the water. So not only is it sediment like pieces of dirt, but you're getting nutrition. And now that nutrition, that good, tasty nutrition, tasty for plants, is now put onto the soil. So that's why silt is so awesome. That's the stuff that we're gonna get. Um, Korean winters are very cold and the summer is very humid and hot. Um, yearly temperature fluctuation reaches 70 degrees C. Yes, not, um, not a great time. <laughs> definitely, definitely not. Um, my family lives in a more temperate region and I remember visiting from uh, from here in the summer, um, it was like 30 or 33 degrees Celsius. And then when I went there, it was like 16 degrees Celsius and everybody was shorts and t-shirt. And I was just like wrapping myself in hoodies and jackets. I was so cold um, just because of that relative difference. So agriculture is going to be happening in Lower Egypt. Again, that's where that delta is going to be. So we're having all that extra awesome agriculture um, in the area that gets the most silt. Okay. With this yearly, sorry, <clears throat> this yearly flood, that's going to affect all of the Nile Delta. So we're going to have these nice fields that grow around the Delta, cool, but at the Delta, that's where we're going to get most of the farm or the biggest area for farmland. So if I'm going from lower to upper Egypt, I'm using the winds. And if I'm going from upper to lower Egypt, I'm just using the Nile's current, just in case anybody cares. <clears throat> Dry summer is better for human activities. Um, yeah, I would say so. Um, it's also less hot. Just the perception of, um, of that, that the heat index, it's le it appears less hot. Uh, because you're able to get rid of some of that heat through sweat as opposed to sweating and then humidity on top of it is not a fun time. So Mesopotamia was made of a lot of different city-states. As we talked about last time, Mesopotamia is not a nation. Mesopotamia is a region. And inside this region, there are these city-states. You guys have probably heard of some of these, like Assyria, Nineveh, um, Ashur, and so on. <clears throat> I had breathing trouble this summer. It was really painful. I'm sorry to hear that. I hope that you were able to find something that helped or at least figured out what was, what was triggering that. Um, so some of the cities are, you know, the nations are a little bit bigger, like Sumer, um, like where the Sumerians were. So they had their own cities on top of that as well. And some other uh, cities as well, if you guys are curious, okay. But Egypt is pretty isolated. If I live in a place like this, that means that, remember we showed that, um, that city like Jericho and how it had that really big wall around it. That's something that's going to protect me from everybody else who wants to get in. But I'm in Egypt. I'm pretty isolated. Why? Can anybody guess why Egypt would be pretty isolated? That if I'm going to worry about invasions or something, I'm typically going to worry about it coming from another part of Egypt as opposed to an invading army from somewhere else. Now, of course, the Egyptians were invaded by outsiders, but it was pretty rare. Anybody know why that is? I'll let you guys answer that. Uh, excuse me. <clears throat> So why might 
Egypt be really isolated from outsiders, from foreigners. Bing da bing. It looks like maybe you guys are busy or no answer. That's okay. Uh, we'll just go ahead and, sorry, I think I have a something that's not supposed to be in here. That's all right. We'll just set this aside. So, of course, this beautiful Nile River is awesome. That's where we want to be. That's where we're doing all that farming. And the reason we want to be so close to that is because everything else is desert. Okay. Hey, very good. We got desert here. Exactly. Just as I said it. Deserts are not the end, um, but if a river is a highway, a desert is definitely a desert. <laughs> I mean, there's no other way to really, really say that. It's not even a, you know, a cobblestone road or something. A desert is very difficult for people to want to go through. Um, so that's why typically if there was any type of invasions, it would be from areas that were along the Nile or just more south um, out of that sub-Saharan kind of region. So things didn't really change for Egypt. A lot of the farming was very similar, clothing, buildings, a lot of it pretty much just remained the same. So that's a pretty interesting thing. If we can, we can look at this art. So we got a difference of, of what, about, about 1500 years. And the art pretty much stays the same. That's pretty, pretty intense. Okay, especially with Farah Hatshep said here, um, Nefertiti as Smenkare was her own pharaoh as well. Um, there were other female pharaohs, but Farah Hatshep wanted to be portrayed very masculinely, <laughs> very uh, masculine style. So even though we have Farah Hatshep who is female, and these guys are male pharaohs, it's like the exact same look, isn't it? Sometimes um, Farah Hatshepsut would be sporting a false beard, which is pretty cool. No candy for the right answer. I will give you... Oh, didn't we give the... We don't have a gold star. We have the the steel um, razor blade. <laughs> so that that's it. Good job. We'll put like a, like a star. Okay. <laughs> it's shiny. It counts. Um, actually, there's a Korean song named Dessert. Okay. Well, that... I mean, cool. Um, I do not know it, but cool. So I think this is really interesting, just this whole concept of your art not changing. Like, think of something that ha that we have now, that we also had 1,500 years ago, and it's pretty similar. Can we think of anything? What do we have today that existed 1,500 years ago in the same format? Like, you can't say something like, I don't know, writing a letter versus email. Well, both of it's a type of written communication. Nothing like that. We're talking about something that has stayed pretty much in the same form. For example, here we have um, sculptures. Can you think of anything that we had 1,500 years ago that we have today that has pretty much remained unchanged? I'm trying to think of one. Can't even say religion because religion has changed. Can't even say Catholicism because Catholicism has changed. Islam has changed. Judaism has changed. Hmm. What would it be? Can we think of anything? I can't think of anything. If you guys can think of anything, let me know. I mean, even clothing styles and fashion, you know, that that's changed. So it's, it's interesting. Simple math? Okay. Yeah, I'll go with that. Simple math. Yeah. Even the more complex math has changed. So it's, it's pretty interesting to just appreciate that level of consistency and security. Um, things between men and women? I, I disagree, um, especially with like the, the advent of um, modern day feminism, um, allowing... Uh, I mean, the Egyptians even, I mean, Egyptian women were rather, rather free to just kind of do what they would like uh, for the most part. 
Um, and there was, you know, a good deal of, uh, of, of equality, um, not just between men and women, but transgendered individuals um, in, uh, what's his name, Ashoka's um, dynasty, or Ashoka's um, rule in early India. Um, but 1500 years ago, the way that women are treated, like, if you kind of picked a, a place, you know, whether we're talking about Korea, we're talking about Europe, we're talking about, um, you know, certain areas there. I mean, women were, were like property. You know what I mean? They're not property now. So I would definitely disagree. Yeah. <clears throat> bricks are pretty consistent. Okay. Maybe bricks. Yeah. I would say bricks and simple math. But, you know, even how we use bricks is a little different, right? Maybe. Rich family, poor family. Yeah, maybe we still have rich and poor. Um, yeah, poor people still doing a lot of manual labor. Yeah, that's something I, I think would have, have stayed the same, unfortunately. Um, in Egypt, there's not really a word for religion. Um, that's because to Egyptians, it was just how life was. It's not like, oh, yeah, there's, you know, we have to go to you know, temple on Sunday. It was just, this is what you do. This is how life is. You know, if I, if I want my clothes to be clean, I wash them. And if I want the Nile to flood correctly, I go, you know, honor one of the gods. That's just what you did. Okay. Um, things have changed between men and women since I was in high school. Yeah, that's, that's true. That's true. Yeah. Um, so just like the Mesopotamians, uh, the Egyptians were polytheists and we have our Ibis headed God here. Um, does anyone know any of these others? That's okay if you don't. I think a lot of them are pretty recognizable. And we talked about having a favorite god. Anybody have any favorite gods? So the pharaoh, though, was considered to be a form of one of the gods. He was the son of Ra, which can be written R-A or R-E, so that's why I included that spelling here. Um, so he was basically like a, like a human avatar of one of the gods. So what's going on in Egyptian society. Now, we have, um, don't believe we've actually found any of these in archaeology. We've only seen these paintings or uh, depictions of them. Um, but as far as finding the crown, the physical crown, I don't think we found them just yet. Um, so we ended up having this like separate Egypt. There were upper Egyptians, there were lower Egyptians, and eventually they were united under Pharaoh Menes. Okay, not Menes. Menes, Menes, sorry, do not speak Egyptian. Um, the crown was combined, which I thought, that's pretty cool. That's a cool concept, you know, and they seem to work pretty, pretty well, right? It's like, this one's open, this one's not. <laughs> so they worked out pretty well, I think. Um, so they, before that, were doing their own thing. And of course, much, much before that, um, people were living in this area before it became a civilization, before the creation of agriculture. Um, so, you know, remember that Egypt, as we know it, is its thing in history. It is not when people started living there. Okay, just to remember that. Um, Osiris is the one I remember. Yeah, Osiris, and she had an interesting time. Um, the one I like is, is Newt. Egypt, ah, Egypt, that's okay. We'll just go with it. Uh, I just like how she's portrayed in a lot of these because she's the sky. <laughs> so it's kind of cool. Um, just like how she's, I guess it's the dome, right? This is somebody's modern version of it, which I think looks really cool. So I just think it's interesting. Like, I just got this super long body in some of it. So it's just a interesting style choice. These are some of the artifacts that we found from prehistory. Um, people that were living here, you know, it was like small farming. It wasn't really a huge civilization. And that's why we talked about Mesopotamia first, because as far as we know, civilization really started there. Um, even though Egypt's really, really famous. Now, has anybody heard this ancient aliens thing that instead of these like small farming communities, that instead ancient Egypt and all of the giants, uh, you know, megalithic, construction like the pyramids the sphinx and stuff have you guys heard that those were actually built like thirty-six thousand years ago 
Has anybody heard that? This is like the ancient aliens thing, or it's a like an alternative archaeology. Has anyone heard that before? And one of the um, pieces of evidence they tried to submit is that, well, the Sphinx has a lot of um, rainwater uh, erosion, like rain erosion on the Sphinx. Therefore, um, this could have only been built when the area got a lot more rain. Therefore, it was at least built at least 12,000 years ago. Um, if not 36,000 years ago. Yeah, it's on the History Channel. I, I, I present this stuff to you guys and also to my, my other students um, because you should know that people are going to talk about it. Um, the developed world except for Japan is now a woman's world because men stopped studying, playing games, and soccer, and as a result got bad manual labor jobs. I, I think a lot of politicians uh, would probably disagree with that because there are still a lot of politicians, engineers, um, architects, doctors, uh, research scientists, surgeons. Um, a lot of them are still, uh, as a lot of those, those are still male-dominated fields. Um, so the the Sphinx situation, let's see, yes, I replicated something. Um, Hiram, I'm not sure what you're what you're referring to there. So this there is water erosion on it, but it's on the enclosure. Okay. Um, it appears that, and this is not unusual or anything, um, but the Nile River has moved. So where we have the pyramids now, this used to be like where the, the Nile used to be. So the Nile now is not right next to the Sphinx. It used to be closer to the Sphinx. Over time, rivers, they meandered, so they moved. Um, so because of that, when the Nile River did its yearly flooding, that pours into the Sphinx enclosure. Now does that make sense? The reason that we say we can say that is because if it was due to rain, it would be found here and it would be found on the Sphinx itself. And yes, there's a lot of other types of erosion that has happened on the Sphinx, but we don't see any evidence of rain erosion on the Sphinx, but we do see water erosion on the enclosure. So we know that the Nile used to be closer, we know the Nile floods, and we see that it's on the enclosure. Again, if it was rain, it would be the enclosure and on the Sphinx but it's not, okay? Um, also, the Sphinx is more likely um, a dog than it is a cat, but that's, uh, that's another another thing. And there's some ideas that there might be additional Sphinx. Um, we would have to find them. They might be buried. Um, remember, the Sphinx that we have was was buried, like, up to here. So it's, it's pretty interesting. Um... Let's see. Most new doctors, lawyers, law professionals, and diplomats outside the 30% gender equality quota are women in Korea. Um, okay. I mean, I don't, I don't have any of the, the evidence on that um, in terms of, uh, like, I don't have any, anything to say, yes, I agree, or no, I disagree. Um, but, you know, if, if that is the case, you know, I, I do know, of course, I'm not saying that women are, are doing a lot of manual labor jobs. Um, uh, but I don't know about diplomats outside the 30% gender equality quota because the last I did check, the politicians that are female in Korea, it's either 9% or 11%. Um, it's quite low compared to the rest of the world. Either way, um, it would still be different than uh, 1,500 years ago. So I'm not, I'm not sure what, if you're just adding an aside AABB, I'm not sure how this was related to what we're talking about, but either way, yeah, it would still be the difference um, from 1500 years ago for sure. Um, I have a doctor's note and it's for a stuffed pair of scrolls. Okay, I again, Hiram, not sure what that has to do with, um, with that. Okay, Korea has a lot of architecture and civil engineers and CAD experts like yourself, both men and women. Cool. Um, I, 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 again, I'm not sure like what, what you guys are trying to, to discuss. Are you trying to say that it's 50% uh, or is it what AABB was trying to seem to be implying that it's um, more than 50% women and fewer and that all men are now like doing these manual labor jobs or just living at home and playing games. 
I'm not I'm not exactly sure. Um, I'm not sure what point you guys are trying to make. <laughs> I really, I'm really, really struggling to find out what point you guys are trying to make and how it's related to ancient Egypt. Um, you guys are of course welcome to to keep talking about it. Um, but if we can try to maybe keep it a bit more on topic, that would be helpful um, for sure. Um, so Pharaoh Mani starts the Egypt's first dynasty, and we can see him here with the. I mean, this guy, it's it's over for this guy, isn't it? This guy's gonna get smashed. Now, with this head, hair, like, holding position, it would almost look like he's gonna slash his throat, but he's holding what looks like a mace. And so I think he's just gonna bash this guy's face in. It's quite an interesting uh, depiction overall. Um, let's see. The ancient scrolls were the old equivalents to modern cloud storage and the columns of the old temples with scripture on them. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't know if, if they would be exactly equivalent to modern cloud storage. I would say they might be more equivalent to, like, modern libraries, maybe. Uh, but I don't know about modern cloud storage, because that sort of implies that you can access them from wherever. Um, so that's why I think it's more of a physical library, because you can access it when you go there. Um, so I think that might be a, a better, um, better comparison. Um, so for those of you that are not familiar with a dynasty, um, a dynasty is kings that come from the same family line. So it's a monarchy, but you're related. Okay, so monarchy is like a single governing situation, right? It's I, I am the king or I am the queen and this is me doing this thing. Um, a dynasty is the, that you are, it's like over time, monarchies over time and the different monarchs are related to each other, um, genetically related. So the Egyptian kingdoms, we can kind of split into three periods. It's the Old Kingdom, Middle Kingdom, and New Kingdom. Um, and when I was uh, on Paul Gia's web or his, uh, his sh um, show, I would call it a show, uh, we did talk about um, one of the people on AIG had misunderstood Middle Kingdom as being a physical place. Um, that there was the Upper Egypt, Middle Kingdom, and Lower Egypt, and it, that's not what it is. So it's, it's, uh, these are time periods. The Old Kingdom, Middle Kingdom, New Kingdom are time periods. Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt are locations. Um, Ancient and 18th Dynasty, Old and New Kingdom, Lord Charles Carnarvon and Howard Baker's tragic deaths uh, may very well have simple medical explanations. Uh, I heard it was just um, malaria. Yeah, that's what I had heard. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with the uh, uh, Lord Carnarvon, um, this idea was that when they had unlocked the tombs of uh, King Tut, um, there was an inscription about a curse that would befall anybody who disturbs the tomb. Um, and then they had died of mysterious circumstances, but really it was just probably malaria. Um, so each of these kingdoms, we define them as like long-term stability, no invasions, strong leaders. When we lose that stability, when we get invaded, when we're having weak leaders and it's kind of falls into disarray and there's fighting, that's when the kingdom ends. Okay. So that kind of gives you this idea here. Um, so the old kingdom starts with the unification and we get, is this supposed to be? trying to think of what this is over here um, but we have the sun temple in memphis um so we end up having this kingdom that lasts for about 500 years okay the egyptians the the pharaohs are going to have 100 percent power but they're going to have helpers which makes sense right is the pharaoh going to go house to house collecting taxes is the pharaoh going to go house to house to ensure people are doing all the things they're supposed to be doing and checking every single job site? No. So just because you have 100% power doesn't mean you want to be in charge of absolutely everything. So because of this need to keep control of many different people and the pharaoh not being able to physically do that, we create bureaucracy. Now I know bureaucracy has a lot of really negative terms today and it's all of this idea like, doing too much paperwork and so on and so forth but really the bureaucracy that we're talking about is just administrative groups of people they are nobles or otherwise higher up in society um, and they are the ones that deal with rules 
Um, they make rules. They have special rules for themselves as well. So because the pharaohs are gods, we want them to keep doing work after death. Okay, so can you imagine you're the son of the sun god, right? Or you're the sun god's representation, like in, in physical embodiment on earth, and then you die. That night is going to be pretty tense. Because if they didn't manage to help you cross over the right way, you end up with the sun not rising the next day. So how, how scary would that be, you know? Um, let's see, in the comments section, Upper Egypt is south instead of north, but that's simply because of the flow of the Nile. Yes, uh, Hiram, that's, that's what we talked about. That's why I did Lower Egypt and Upper Egypt visually here. Uh, so we talked about that earlier in the PowerPoint. Um, actually, I thought you were here the whole time. All right. So we know, a lot of you know that the Egyptians had these ideas about life after death and this afterlife concept. Um, the afterlife was really just continuation of life. That's all it was. Um, it wasn't that you went to a heaven if you were a good person. It went to a type of hell if you were a bad person. You either continued to live or you didn't. Um, this is part of the Book of the Dead, which basically was a bunch of instructions for you to make sure you can go to the afterlife. Um, what we have in this image here is our good friend Anubis weighing the heart against this feather. And so this feather represents like goodness, truth, and all of this stuff. And they weigh your heart physically. You know when you do something and you feel bad about it or guilty, you get like a heaviness in your chest? That feeling is what the Egyptians thought kind of like added a heaviness to your heart. So someone with a literally heavy heart would uh, weigh more than the feather. If that happens, you go over to our good friend here. Uh, we have a, what do you guys see here in this like three part animal? I'm gonna let you guys answer that so I can enjoy my, it's supposed to be a peppermint mocha, but that cacao has been settling pretty hard. A bit bitter, it's okay. I mean, it's a pretty vicious animal, right? Three vicious animals put together. I'm just not sure how well you guys can see it. Um, if you're having issues seeing it, this is a crocodile head, an upper body of a leopard, and the lower body of a hippopotamus. A hippopotamus, they tend to kill people a lot, even though they're vegetarians. They are very aggressive and surprisingly fast on land, so you best watch out. Yeah, people with cardiomegaly, right? Exactly. Amuts, exactly. Crocodile, leopard, and hippo. That's right. I just want to make sure you guys know it's a leopard and not a jaguar. Jaguars are in South America. And wearing Santa pants. Well, those Santa pants are the hippo pants, so I guess, yeah, it's a bowl, a, a butt full of jelly, I guess, would be, would be it there. If your heart was heavier than the feather, your good friend Amut is going to eat you. End of story. You're done. That's it. Has anybody heard of indulgences in Catholicism? That's my question for you, but I'm also going to continue on while you guys answer that. Have you heard of indulgences in Catholicism? Um, another way that you could fail the afterlife test is if you take a misstep and fall um, into this chasm. And you're, just, you're just gone. That's it. So it was either you managed to answer the questions correctly, do all the right things, take the correct paths in this like maze-like path to the afterlife, um, or you don't and you're dead forever. That's it. And actually that was the, the early, like the Jewish interpretation as well. You either continued to live or you just died. And early Christianity was the same way as well. You just died. That was, that was it. Um, yeah, the crocodile water god. A little a little bit different, a little bit different. Um, yes, so the indulgences, um, some are absolutely has heard of them. Um, so the indulgences are pretty, pretty interesting. For those of you that haven't heard of them, basically, if I commit some kind of sin in Catholicism, I repent of my sin and I have to do a certain number of prayers and so forth to 
sort of not negate the sin, but to uh, pay for the sin. An indulgence is something that I can purchase and somebody does that for me. So now instead of me um, atoning for my sin, a bunch of people are supposed to atone for it for me because I paid for this item. So let's say that I always have this right here. It's this uh, this lip lip balm. Um, if I bought this item, let's say this represents a hundred Hail Mary prayers. So there would be maybe 10 people that would say 10 Hail Mary prayers on my behalf each. And then it's, it's taken care of for me. That was this concept, which of course has nothing to do with anything biblical. And there's a lot of um, issues with that and a lot of criticism for that. This actually happened in ancient Egypt. So even with the Catholicism concept of an indulgence, it's not a new concept. Um, there was this idea here to add weight to the feather side. So there were these items that you would buy, these idols, that would add weight to the feather side. So even if your heart was heavy, if you're adding weight to the side of the feather, then your heart would not weigh more than the feather's side. So you actually ended up with these indulgences things in, in, uh, in ancient Egypt too. So it's pretty, pretty interesting. Um, Protestantism started that people would literally buy forgiveness. Well, it wasn't just that. Protestantism um, started for several reasons. Um, but yeah, they did protest, right? Um, they weren't the only ones to protest, for sure. Um, the idol issue had separated the um, Eastern Orthodox Church, for example. So this is one of the reasons that you you ended up mummifying your leaders. And at first it was just the leaders, and then it was just kind of like anybody that could afford it. Um, the mummification process is pretty interesting. We've basically figured it out, and that's cool. Um, we haven't find we haven't found like any recipes exactly written out, um, as far as I know, in terms of archaeology. Uh, we can basically understand how they did it. Uh, we found a lot of their tools for doing it as well, and yeah, it's just kind of like you know beef jerky on a different scale. Um, there's also other ways that mummies can be made, intentionally or accidentally. You can accidentally make a dry mummy if you happen to die in a hot desert and are immediately buried. So let's say that there is a simum, a like a, a desert uh, sandstorm, covers you up, you are cooked and burnt and like, uh, you're cooked and suffocated to death kind of at the same time. Um, and then you're covered by this sand. This is gonna take the moisture out of your body and eventually when someone, if someone finds you later, um, you're gonna be this dried, corpse you know this mummy so that's a way that we can have a dry mummy accidentally made has anyone heard of different ways that other mummies are made remember the goal is to mummification is to make a mummy and a mummy is a body that doesn't decay so what are some ways we can prevent decay we think of this you know classic egyptian deliberate mummy there's actually a lot of different ways to make mummies the mummies in Peru, yes. So those mummies are frozen mummies, not ice mummies. They're frozen mummies. Um, these are mummies that are in an area that is very, 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 very cold. So they are high altitude. There's not a lot of precipitation that can become ice to damage the skin. And there's not a lot of animals or bugs or anything that really live up there. Um, there's also low oxygen. So any of those bacteria that eat your body um, after you die, those tend to not be able to get enough oxygen to support that, you know, living and consumption of your body. Um, so we end up with these frozen mummies that are really gorgeous. Um, we can look at these, um, let's see, Peru, Vienna, mummy. So they look really gorgeous. Um, some of them are dried out. Some of them have a, a different level of, of preservation. Don't look at this alien mummies thing, please. Um, this is really one of the classic ones. Um, this is from the Incan uh, time period, so it's not as old as maybe some of these other mummies might be. And of course, she's covered in a lot of clothing, um, so that's also going to help preserve her skin. But just a really, really gorgeous, gorgeous mummy, isn't it? Just You can even see her hair and everything. Just really gorgeous. Um, the ice mummies are going to look like... Uh, meat that got left in your freezer too long. Um, what's his name? Bitsy. 
I guess you can just write Otzi, right? Um, Utsi is going to be our classic ice mummy. He's got all of his organs and everything in there. They're just really, 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 really dehydrated. Um, and in the same way, <clears throat> excuse me, in the same way that you would have those pieces of meat like flaking off if you've left meat in the freezer too long, we actually have some of that happening here. So it's kind of kind of interesting to see him. So he's going to look really, really, really dry. Um, but he has to stay cold. And that's the same with the frozen mummies um, that we saw before, those high altitude frozen mummies. Um, they have to be cold, otherwise they're going to start to defrost and then decompose. So that, that coldness is also preserving them. Um, Utsi, the way that he was preserved was that he was covered by snow and ice. Um, if he would have just died in the snow and ice where he was, he probably would have been um, consumed by an animal. So he was covered by snow and ice. He, it appears that he was killed, um, that somebody had murdered him. So he was not only not by himself, but he was in an area that perhaps had more traffic. Um, so that would really lend itself to having more animals as traffic as well. And leaving him uh, pretty, you know, free, free easy pickings for, for dinner. Um, so he was covered up by ice and snow afterwards. So those are, those are three different types of mummies we talked about. There's actually two more, uh, the bog mummy and the wet mummy. Both of them tend to be quite wet. Um, I remember a female mummy with a tattoo. There's a lot of them, actually, a lot of them. Um, yes, the bog mummy, the atheist. So the bog mummies, a lot of them are found in the UK. These we can see quite obviously because of their color okay regardless of what their hair color may have been regardless of what their skin color may have been we end up with this color change the skin color turns basically pitch black and the hair color which you can see here it's sort of a, a reddish brown color okay so why does this happen? So a bog is a, so a peat bog that these are found in, this is a wetland or swamp, however you want to call it, but it has peats. What is peats? Excuse me. It's this stuff here, okay? Having a peat bog, that's pretty difficult for any kind of thing that needs um, oxygen to, to live in. Additionally, you can see here that this guy is scooping this out. He's doing it because you can burn peat. It's really, really good for burning. It's like, um, you can kind of think about it as pre-coal. Coal, of course, is compressed. Um, this is compressed carbon as well, but not as compressed as coal would be. Um, but it is used for, for burning stuff. Um, but you can see it is compressed. And this is why we end up with this flattened kind of look. So no, not only is it difficult for um, for anything to break it down because of the lack of oxygen, so there's no fish or anything really living in these, these um, peat bogs, but then over time you end up being crushed by this peat. Um, so it's pretty, pretty interesting. Um, human hibernation would be great. I would like to live a thousand years. Yeah, I think it would be awesome too. Um, cranberries are more disgusting. Mummification of John Paul Jones. I'm, I'm not sure who John Paul Jones is. Uh, mummification. I'm not sure what you mean. Is it is it a is it this guy that you're talking about? Uh, like Captain Jones? Is that the person that you're talking about? Um, if you want to share what you know about this mummification, um, feel free. Um, just want to touch on the wet mummy before we, we go uh, and continue on. Um, so the wet mummies, most of them we found are in China, um, almost exclusively. We found, as far as I know, two, but I don't want to say 100%. We might find them later. There may be some that I, I'm not aware of. Um, the most famous is this mummy here, Lady Dai. Um, pretty weird looking kind of thing we got going on. This is her tongue here. Uh, this is like her eye, and then this other part around here is like the, the sclera, the white part of her eye. So her eyes have actually come out. Um, her preservation is amazing. The people, like if you want to watch Lady Die, I'll put a maybe a, a, a com or a link to it in the comments or the details section, um, or both. 
uh, she, like, they performed an autopsy on her. That's, that's how well preserved she is. There were a lot of attempts on preserving bodies in the ancient world. And one option was this. We're not really sure if the wet mummy was deliberate or accidental or both. But we don't know what the liquid is entirely made out of. Um, now, some people might have a, you know, a question about that. Like, can't we just test it? Don't, don't, you know, we can just test the liquid that they're found in. And we can, but that doesn't mean we understand all the compounds. Um, we're still finding new compounds um, even today for even things that people have used for traditional medicine for a really long time. We're now isolating these compounds, understanding how they work. Um, so just because we can test the liquid does not mean that we understand what is in there. Um, but these wet mummies, again, very well preserved. It has to be something to do with keeping oxygen out and also preserving um, the skin. But the brain is, is preserved, the hair is preserved, the organs are preserved. We know the last thing she ate, for example. Um, they're very well preserved mummies. Please do not confuse this with a water mummy. There's, there's not really a water mummy. Um, these are wet mummies, but the liquid is not water. So just so we know this, we have a dry mummy, frozen mummy, ice mummy, bog mummy, and wet mummies, but not water mummies, okay? Um, in Andong, they found a mummy with a love letter. Yeah, uh, my students had mentioned that to me uh, when we talked about wet mummies this year. Um, was it a wet mummy, though? Because they were not sure about that. Um, let's see. There was a bad railroad in Andong, which had been closed and was dismantled to make things right, to make things right with what is, uh, in what way to make things right with what? Was it going over the mummy or, or something like that? Um, so we talked about the different kinds of mummies. Cool, great. Um, so these mummies, of course, they're dry mummies with hot air, salt, and removing the internal organs. Um, I will put a link to that um, as we talked about before I can't put a video in here because then it flags that the video is I don't know against the rules or something so the old kingdom ends with war and 150 years after this war starts we get the middle kingdom and there's some differences happening first of all this is a fun picture I think um, I can make it a little bigger for you I do think it's kind of a fun picture because this guy is just what what are they depicting in this image can you guys see it based on parasites found in mummies they figure out the diet yeah i think it's it's super super amazing um the railroad was made by the japanese uh, well they are changing a lot of stuff in terms of of the japanese um uh, these days uh they had not recently but within the time that I've been here, they changed the, um, the address system because it was based on the uh, Japanese method. Does anybody see what's going on in this image here in terms of what's, like, what's happening? I'm not expecting to read the hieroglyphs, of course, um, but what, what is going on? Anybody know? Um, I'm not sure what you're, you're meaning there, Hiram. I know Hiram's message didn't post because there was like a, a profanity reference. I don't know if, if we'll put that in there, but, but yeah. So this is not cuneiform. Um, these are hieroglyphics. So they are, they're different in that they are pictures. Um, cuneiform had some early kind of quasi picture stuff. And depending on how you read it. Some of it is like logograms, which would be like um, uh, it's like a like a thing that represents a, a concept, um, or they are read as syllables. Um, so that's that's another another way to read them. A cuneiform has been used for a long, long time. Um, so what we have here, if you guys are not able to see it, or if you can see it and you just can't type, uh, it's a banquet. So it's pretty, pretty interesting. So the guy looks like he might be singing into an ice cream cone, uh, but that's most likely like a, a leg joint. So that top part, maybe there's bones or something sticking out of it. And this guy is just ready to go to town. We've got, it looks like the leg of a, maybe a gazelle, a goat head, 
some kind of bone with meat around it. I mean, this is something you would see in like a like a Nintendo. Uh, what's the, what's that game? It was like an arcade game, and then it got moved to to different Nintendo systems, and then I think it was on PS One. Um, no, it starts with a G. Gauntlet Legends. So this looks like some kind of meat you would find there. Uh, we've got a goose, a fish, um, some kind of antelope. Uh, big old sausage looking thing. Uh, these spikes, I'm not sure what the spikes are supposed to be representing. The circles may represent bread. So this guy's hanging out to eat. Okay, he's just having a good time. So some of the differences in the Middle Kingdom is, number one, the Pharaoh cared more about the people instead of being this like far away, removed God concept. Um, and they started trading with a lot of outside regions like Syria, Kush, Crete, and Mesopotamia. Um, if you guys are going to be talking about Kush and any kind of references to any greenery, um, yes, that is partially where some of the um, of that that herb comes from. Um, is the the mountains in that region? We'll talk about that in a later um, a later thing. Uh, Egypt also expanded by taking over Nubia. Nubia is a kingdom to the south of Egypt. So as we talked about, we have this. Uh, government structure here um farmers slaves those are going to be the majority of people okay the pharaohs own the land they give it to nobles and the nobles pay farmers to work the land okay so this is a system that we end up using for so 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 many years um farmers and slaves are forced to do stuff like serve in the military but also build things um, not pyramids. The pyramids were constructed. A lot of these, um, uh, I'm not saying that the, the pyramid construction people um, could not be chosen from among slaves, um, but these were people that had like good medical care. They were taken care of very well. They had their own place that they lived. Um, some of them were literate. They were able to write um, notes and stuff to each other. And we know that because we found the like the construction workers' villages. And we found these big pieces of um, pottery that were basically used like text messages. You can kind of scrawl something on the back of this pottery and pass your note to somebody. Um, and so we were very excited when we found this and it was just like, oh wow, you know, what esoteric co you know discussions were they having? And it was just stuff like, hey, do you wanna get drunk after work? You know, it was just, just that kind of thing. Um, they were sexting each other, you know, this was just very everyday people doing everyday things. Um, so this wasn't like, you know, discussions on the gods and, and oh, was the pharaoh that, no, it was just, hey, you want to get drunk after work, you know, it was just that kind of stuff. Um, yes, Gauntlet was, uh, was very fun. Um, today, that's where some of the worst anti-black racism really happens, that imaginary line that separates South Sudan from Ethiopia. Um, yep, and I would also imagine there, there would be some, um, so South Sudan is, uh, Muslim as far as, as, uh, not just in majority, but I, I believe that's also part of the government, um, and Ethiopia is not, so there might be some of that as well. Um, arranged marriages are going to be pretty common just for everybody. Um, usually around the time the girl is four, or 12 and the boy is 14, um, husbands are the leaders of the house and stuff, but... You know, women could be pretty much able to do most of the stuff they're able to do today. Getting a job, owning property, receiving inheritance, divorce, that sort of thing. Um, and unlike in other cultures, um, they could make their own money, operate businesses, and of course some of them even became pharaohs. Um, Pharaoh Nefertiti, as we talked about, um, especially under the name Smenkare. Uh, Pharaoh Hatshepsut, which we had talked about earlier in this, um, how she had been depicted in a very masculine way, and here she is with that false beard. And also Pharaoh Cleopatra. Um, Cleopatra was Macedonian, um, but of course still a pharaoh in Egypt. Um, I wonder if Bir Tawal was ever inhabited. Uh, not, not off the top of my head. I don't, I don't have any answer for you there. So the inventions, of course, we have the hieroglyphics. And these, again, are logograms. They're going to be to represent a concept more than a sound. Of course, there's a sound to pronounce them, um, but it's more of a concept rather than like a phonetic kind of thing. 
Um, if you care about the Book of the Dead, um, this is one of the plates that has been translated into English, so you can check that out later if you would like. Um, so for fun, you know, there are people that use some of these um, types of sounds to write their name. Um, you know, if you want to do that, it's a good time. Um, using their understanding of astronomy, especially Sirius, the star Sirius, not super serious especially <laughs> uh they end up making this calendar with 365 days and Sirius was one of their major um points in the sky so it wasn't just the sun and the moon but it was also tracking Sirius um has anybody heard the name or the phrase the dog days of summer has anybody heard of that the dog days of summer I'm gonna let you guys answer that um but I am gonna go on as we're thinking about that of course, um, one of the more popular contributions to history, um, and I guess cultural history, uh, would be these really famous buildings, which are the pyramids. Um, here's one of the early pyramids, which was a step pyramid, because it looks like steps. Um, so the step pyramid of Djoser is going to be one of them. Um, Opal Pal says yes, that they've heard of the dog days of summer. Um, the dog days of summer has a reference to Sirius. So in the like the longest part of summer, the hottest time of summer, that's when Sirius was most visible. Um, Sirius, the nickname of Sirius is the dog star. And so when they were talking about like the longest days of summer, they're talking about the Sirius days of summer. So we know this is the longest point and then after that. Um, I would say if we were to use a similar concept, we would talk about summer solstice, which of course is based on the sun and not the star. Uh, because of precession and the time that has passed, Sirius does not show up in the same way on the same days, um, but that's what it meant, the dog days of summer. It was the days that Sirius was was in the sky. Um, so it doesn't have to do with like eating dogs or sweating and panting like a dog. I mean, dogs don't sweat, but you know, like the... <laughs> kind of panting like a dog because it's so hot. It doesn't have to do with that. Um, it has to do with the Sirius the dog star. Um, yes, so that's what Hiram said as well, Sirius the dog star. Uh, yes, Cleopatra was during the Ptolemy dynasty and she, yeah, she, she was Macedonian. Um, she was also the seventh one. The one that we know is Cleopatra the seventh. So that is also fun to know. Um, these are some of the really gorgeous um, statues and every time I see this image I'm just staggered by how big these statues are. I mean these are gigantic. This is uh, the Valley of the Kings. So I know some of you may have heard something about oh well the pyramids were never used for uh, the kings. There's no sarcophagus and there's all blah blah blah. It's you know, they were. Um, we have writing from them at this time period. They were used as burial sites for the kings. The problem is that they became very easy to loot. Um, you could also scratch off anything or just touching the walls, especially as you're trying to navigate in the dark. You're removing paint as you're doing that. Not a great time. The Valley of the Kings, um, you guys probably know from King Tut. There's also been a lot of um, other findings in this region, uh, but this is where you buried the pharaohs instead. Um, there's some accounts that after the construction finished, the priests would kill the workers. Um, not 100% sure on that, but it does kind of show just how secretive this region was. Um, and that is what I have for you. We are stopping here. If you guys have any last minute questions, uh, please let me know. Otherwise, I'm going to take a break and probably record the, the short version of this and all of that good stuff. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this. We've had some pretty interesting uh, conversation, kind of went off, but that's okay. Because overall, we actually ended right on time, um, as opposed to two hours, two and a half hours in. So that's been, that's been good. My back's not killing me entirely. Um, my migraine's not destroying me, so yay. <laughs> all right. Um, thank you guys for joining me. Please let me know either in the comments section or in... Yeah, the comment section, I guess it would be, or on the Discord chat. Um, if you would be too confused or distracted, or I, I don't know how to phrase it necessarily, um, if I also was running a geography class concurrently, um, or if I should just finish 
Do you think it would just make more sense to finish the, the entire textbook of the history class and then start the geography class? Um, just get curious on your, your idea. Um, let me know. And I will see you guys later. Alrighty. Adios. Have fun. Sai chan. All of that good stuff. Bye-bye.